not even entertaining the thought or thinking about being married. You know, there are several times as our children were growing up, we would encourage our kids, enjoy your childhood. Don't get in a big hurry to be grown and gone. Enjoy your childhood because once it's gone, it's gone. You can't get it back. You can't go back. It's in the rear view mirror. So enjoy it. Enjoy today. Do you ever get so busy with life and looking forward to what is yet to come in the afternoon or, or, or later in the week that you forget to enjoy today? I mean, are you already thinking about what's for lunch? Where am I going to go? What am I going to cook? Is it going to be crowded? Is Pastor Ricky going to be long-winded and we're going to be behind all the Baptists? You know, God has given us a wonderful life to live. Whether that life be, as an adult, a married life, or a single life, or, or maybe a combination of both. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Nona and I have often talked about when one of us dies. And she has given me permission that if she goes first, I am welcome to look out into the audience and find her successor. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, just ask my wife after the sermon. We enjoy life, we love each other, and we are thankful for each other. But we, but we also know that that might be a day that one of us is gone, beating the other to the prize of the kingdom of God in Christ Jesus, and the other one would be left behind, and we're not going to stop living if that would ever be the case. Because God wants us to go forth living the life He's given us to live, whether it be in holy matrimony or whether it be single. God's blessing is there for us all. I have never preached a sermon on singleness in 30 years of pastoral ministry. But I have one for you today. Because God placed this in my heart and mind as we were just kind of praying over and pondering this whole theme of, of sermons titled Design. And if you think about it for a moment, when humankind was first created, it was Adam, and Adam was single. And when Eve was created, Eve was single until given to Adam. Now that might have lasted about five minutes. Because God presented Eve to Adam and, and, and you know, they became one with each other. But then all through Scripture, Old Testament and New, you have some wonderful examples of people, great people of faith who never married, or if they did marry and were then widowed or were widowers, then they chose not to marry and went forward with a very fruitful life. So we're going to share some thoughts with you this morning about singleness. And we're going to look at something that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 and then 32 through 40, and it'll be on your screen. And it, it kind of goes back and forth from marriage to single, but he makes some very good points about living a single life. So this should be on your screen. This is the English Standard Version. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Not now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all of you were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. 
To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this to your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he's not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. May God add His richest blessings to the reading of His Word. I want to share with you some thoughts this morning from a gentleman named Zach Franklin. A little article he wrote, just a very short article, Is Singleness Valuable? And he begins this article with this little bit of a paragraph, and it's very eye-opening and challenging to the hearer, and that's why I want you to hear this. Every Christian is preparing for an eternity of singleness. Let that settle down in your heart and mind for a minute. Every Christian is preparing for an eternity of singleness. In heaven there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. Matthew twenty-two thirty. Although the church as a whole will be married to Christ, the earthly institution of one man and one woman joined together for an adult lifespan will no longer exist. In heaven, every saint will be singly devoted to Christ. Since earth is the saint's training ground for heaven, a key question facing any Christian is whether singleness or marriage is the best means of preparing for the eternal kingdom. So we might ask ourselves the question, is singleness or marriage the best means of preparing for the eternal kingdom. Is singleness or marriage the best means of preparing for the eternal kingdom? And the answer to that question is yes. Is singleness or marriage the best means of preparing for the eternal kingdom? The answer would be yes. And why is it yes? It's yes because we need to live however God has gifted us to live. That's how we are to live. And that is the best way to prepare for the eternal kingdom is to live into its fullness, the life that God has given us to live. For some people, that's a life married to another person, hopefully for the fullness of their life, as the vows say, till death to us part. But then to the other to whom God has given the gift, it may be a gift of singleness. It may be for the entire life. It may be for a portion of the life. But whatever God gives us, God gives us the grace to live in that place in life. God's grace is sufficient. 
His strength is made perfect in our weakness. God's grace and God's gifting is always here no matter what season or station of life we find ourselves in. Now, some of the great men and women of the Bible were single. And it is a huge detail that we seldom ever mention. Do you remember anything about Jeremiah's wife? Oh my goodness. We poured through the Old Testament prophets, the major prophets, and then the minor prophets in our read the Bible through in a year. And I've never been so glad to have Scripture behind me instead of before me as I was when we got to the other side of Malachi and I saw Matthew and I said, Thank you, Jesus! Because those prophets and the minor prophets are speaking on behalf of God. The very Word of God saying, Israel, Judah, if you don't turn from your sin and repent, judgment cometh. And they didn't, and it came. And it was ugly. And it broke your heart to see it happen. And it broke God's heart because God had to bring it to pass because He's a just and a righteous God. But then that book of Jeremiah, it's long. Do you ever read a book and you think you're never going to get to the end? Leviticus, right? Yeah. And I'm reading through Jeremiah and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is painful, but it's truth. And then when you get to Jeremiah chapter 16, you hear these words. The word of the Lord came to me. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. Wow. Jeremiah was called by the Lord to a life of singleness that he might fulfill the particular call upon his life and that was to be a prophet to a backslidden Judah. They had walked away from their relationship with God and God desperately wanted them back. He didn't want to bring judgment. And for years and years and decades, he spoke through Jeremiah. And Jeremiah shared that message with the people. And they would not heed the warning. And Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because it broke his heart so he wept over the spiritual condition of Judah. Ladies, would you like to be married to that man? He was sad. He was broken. He was abused by people who called him their friend. God had a special call upon his life. And that call was fulfilled in part by being a single man. Many of the Old Testament prophets such as Elijah, Elisha, and Daniel were single. Daniel in the fiery furnace. Do you ever hear anything about Daniel's wife? No. You do not. Singleness allowed them the mobility, the flexibility, and the freedom to carry out ministries that involve changes of location, rigorous study, and sometimes intense persecution. The same can be said of most of the twelve disciples who lived single lives unrestricted by family concerns and were free to travel throughout the earth to fulfill the Great Commission. Have you watched The Chosen? I've watched one scene of one episode. And it looked pretty good. And if you've watched it, this is the scene that I saw. Jesus calls Peter to follow him. And Peter's all excited that he would be counted worthy by the Messiah to be called as a disciple. And then Peter remembers, "Uh uh-oh, I'm married. And this is not in Scripture, but I can kind of think about it in my mind's eye. He goes back to his wife 
And this is the scene that I saw. And he begins to explain to his wife, Oh, we have found the Messiah. His name is Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. And he's teaching and he's healing and he's doing great and miraculous things. And she's just kind of celebrating with him. And you can tell he doesn't want to tell her what he thinks the good news is because she might not think it's so good. But then he says, uh, 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 He called me to be a disciple. I mean, like he's afraid he's fixing to get hit. Like, what do you mean? You're going to abandon us? Leave me here with all these kids? You crazy. He's afraid of what her response will be. And, and he's kind of, he's, and then she goes, well, that's wonderful, Peter. That's wonderful. But he had responsibility greater than living single for God. He had to go back and touch base with the wife who said it's a wonderful thing that God or Christ has called you to follow Him. Those who embrace singleness wanted to give the maximum amount of time, energy, and money and devotion to God alone. For them, single living was an opportunity not for self-centered living, but for Christ-centered living. And, and, and then, you know, every once in a while, you run up upon that person, and Scripture will have a couple of three verses about that person, and you kind of wonder, why were they included? I don't know. But Anna the prophetess was one of those persons. In Luke chapter 2, we find this story, just a couple of little verses about this precious lady. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Azur. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer Night and day. That's what Mary and Joseph and Jesus found when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day. They found Anna there. Praying, fasting, serving God day and night. Any of you ladies ready to sign up for that? No. It sounds good, but... He likes dinner on the table at 6 o'clock. And I would love to, to spend all my time in prayer and fasting, but I got three young kids at home and, hey, you know, but this lady had given her heart in her singleness. She's a widow now. And instead of remarrying, she gave her heart and life in its entirety to God. And you know what? God recognized her sacrifice, her service, her life in the gospel that has now been repeated for almost 2,000 years. And she has been singled out as a lady who gave her all to God. In singleness. Wow. John the Baptist, have y'all... What, what was his wife's name? No such record. John the Baptist gave his life proclaiming the greatness of another. He spent his adult life, that part of his life that we get to read about in the Gospels, proclaiming the greatness of another. Get ready, He's coming. Prepare your heart. The Messiah's near. He's near. Scholars believe that Paul was probably a widower due to the religious leadership role he played that required that a good male Jew be married. They feel like he was a, a member of the Sanhedrin and that required someone to be married. But nonetheless, Paul identifies in his letter to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 7 that he's single. In verse number 8, he writes, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Now you have to remember, Paul and Peter and John 
all thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. And the world around them was in a terrible shape. And, and even in this chapter, chapter 7, he talks about the crisis at hand. The Roman Empire is not taken too kindly to the Christians. And, and they're persecuting them. And the Jews are persecuting the Christians. And, and, and it's, it's a troubled time for them. Just like maybe in some ways we live in a troubled time today. But he said, it's good for you to remain single as I am. The freedom Paul experienced by being a single man allowed him full devotion to the preaching of the kingdom of God and to planting churches all around the known world of his day. It allowed him the opportunity to write letters and encourage and support those fledgling churches. But at the same time, Paul, in his letters, makes it very clear that he appreciated the fellowship and the communion and the community and the spiritual family of the people of the body of Christ. The church was his family and his community. And let us not forget the most well-known single man in history and Scripture is... Jesus. The perfect will of God was fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord. He did not have to marry, nor was he less of a person for not marrying. He simply did what his father called him to do. I've come to do the will of the one who has sent me. As a matter of fact, if you really thought about the ministry of Jesus, it would have been very difficult for him to have been a husband and a father and do those things that he did as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he was perfectly content living a single life, fulfilling the very will of God in his life. In Christ and in other persons, we were or are single. We see Paul's observations reflected in real lives. What are Paul's observations? The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. How many of you know if mama's not happy, nobody's happy? Mamas are saying, that's true. I, I, I remember all through our married life, I've had to go to Nona and say, Nona, I feel like God is calling me or us to do this. And we would sit down and talk about that and talk about what it meant to our lives, what it meant to our children's lives. And we always said yes to the Lord just because we talked about it didn't mean we ever said no. As a matter of fact, our kids, as they were growing up, come to learn and know that if we had a family meeting, it usually meant we were moving to a new church. And they would go, oh no, not again. I remember sitting at the parsonage at Rainbow City and we called a family meeting and, and, and here they come and just plop down on the couch. <coughs> and we said, we have something to tell you. We know what it is. I said, you do? Yes, you're going to tell us we're going to move. And you know, Blaine was adamant. Blaine had him with some little friends and he said, I don't want to move unless we can go to a church like that one where we went to the youth event that they've got a, a great big Christian life center with a basketball court. I don't want to move unless we go to a church like that. And I said, you mean Fort Payne first? And he said, yes. And I said, that's where we're going. Tickled his little heart. <laughs> but you know, there's some truth in what Paul is saying. If you are married, you've got a divided heart. 
And it's okay because God has made it that way. A husband should love his wife and his children. A wife should love her husband and the children and care about their best interest and to care about raising them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's what God has called us to do and desires we do it. But God and Paul also knows if you're not married, there's a level of devotion you can give to God that maybe a married person will never be able to give. Godly single persons hold a high place among people in Scripture. We need to be mindful to make community, opportunity, and leadership roles available to those who are single among us. They are a part of our spiritual family. We need to be intentional in including singles in our gatherings, in our outings, in our community building activities. Everyone needs the fellowship of the body of Christ. And you know... If you ever get around that single person and they're admiring the child you have, oh, it would be so nice to have a child. Let them bar it for a few days. <laughs> and let them get the joy of parenthood as you reflect upon being single for a few moments in life. Can I just remind you of something that we know, but we sometimes forget? We're all called to live a life fully devoted to God. Married, single, anywhere in between. We're all called to live a life fully devoted to God.